Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're here today to speak with Neil um, about his company, Myco, and learn a little bit about his journey and uh, his love for technology and how he's helping the industry. Uh, my name is Stephen Carter. I'm with Opazenta. I want to introduce Marlena Weitzner as well. She is our regional marketing manager. She's going to be watching the chats for questions and things that you guys have. Uh, Neil and I would love for you guys to go ahead and throw questions at us as we go. Uh, Marlena will, will interrupt us and let us know as questions pop up in the chat room, uh, present those to us, and we'll try to answer them as we go so that way uh, we can get to them all and hopefully uh, keep the conversation moving and, and get you guys what you need. So um, with that being said, again, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and let Neil just kind of briefly introduce himself and we'll, we'll start asking some, some really good questions and move from there. Thanks, Stephen, for having me here today and Marlena for hosting and putting this all together. Uh, appreciate the time and, and the interest uh, in conversation this afternoon, which will be hopefully fun and valuable. Um, my name is Neil Amrine. I'm the CEO and founder of MyGoat, which is a software technology company that uh, specializes, I think, the, the best tagline that we've kind of described what we do is we are Roomba meets Netflix for commercial lawn mowing. So um, we use autonomous robotic mowers and a subscription service that uh, assists commercial property managers, commercial property owners, um, from large landscape companies to uh, obviously cemeteries, which we'll spend a lot of time talking about today, regional airports, golf courses, um, universities, the kind of grounds. Uh, but the concept of my goat is really that uh, autonomous robotic mowers and robots in general are are here, and then every day they're making and manufacturing more of them. We are robot agnostic, so we don't make the hardware; we actually design and develop the software, which is really the user experience. So, in a nutshell, you know, robots will do what they want to do uh, all the time because they are just program that way. Uh, it's how do human beings interact and interface with them? And that's what we really specialize in. How do you work around the robots? How do you maximize and optimize? And we'll talk a little bit about that today. So um, kind of at a high level, uh, that's what we've been doing. I founded the company a little over three years ago, and uh, we've had a lot of success in many different industries and hope to have a, a lot more coming up. Wonderful. Yeah, Neil, and I think, I think that, um, you know, I'd love to hear some of that journey and how you got you got where you are. You, you, you kind of touched on that a little bit. I found it really interesting when we spoke before. So, um, yeah, tell us how how you got to my goal. Just just sum that up for us a little bit. Like, where did you start and how did you get there? And what what drove that interest? Yeah. Um, so historically, I, I had a lot of um, corporate jobs over the years. I, I worked for the Ritz Carlton Hotel Company for a number of years in the hospitality industry with an obviously emphasis on luxury service and and that experience. I spent about a decade in uh, technology as a, say, a recovering mercenary sales guy. Um, so I understand um, kind of that um, arena. But about 12 or 14 years ago, I founded a home health care company that, is, that specializes in non-medical home care services, where we hire caregivers on a part-time basis. And we uh, leverage their skill set, their empathy, uh, their compassion to help and assist seniors with their daily living activities. So uh, we expanded uh, our company, which I still have in here in Tennessee, as well as offices in South Carolina, and uh, realized that uh, after nearly 5,000 folks working with us over the last 12 years, that um, it's always difficult to recruit and hire and train and continue that, that program. Uh, but uh, I came across autonomous robots uh, a little over three and a half years ago, which I've been in in the market since about 1995. So I've never really believed in uh, bleeding edge technology, but you know we're 20, 25 years into what's going on in, in that industry. So uh, I kind of developed, designed the financial operational model and, and took that and ran with it. In some cases, I wish I had some robots that were, um, the artificial intelligence was was advanced enough for them to help some of my seniors, some of my 90 year olds get out of bed in the morning. But uh, kind of kicked it off and started from there and and have been so successful. So really, I, I'd say my superpower, if, if I had any superpowers, would be the understanding of, of labor and uh, and numbers as far as that's concerned. And uh, how do we streamline uh, 
you know, what we do. I also believe in applying technology. I don't know that new technology is really being invented. I think we're in an era where technology is being applied. Probably since the internet, there haven't been any real new innovative things that have gone on, but now how do you how do you apply the, the things that are out there? And I think that's a new iteration of what we got going on. So we'll talk more about that today, I hope. Definitely, yeah. And I know we, we have talked a little bit about that in the past with your team and um, they're a lot of fun and, and I'm so super excited. So we've been on the road and at conventions and things like that. I know we're both gonna be in Hilton Head next week at uh, the SCC, SCCFA or, or the Southern Convention. So super excited to meet you guys. Um, and hear some of your uh, your stories about my goat, but um, you know one of the things that we get asked a lot is is about our name, Opacenta. So uh, Latin is uh, uh, Opus is a Latin word for business, and then Zenta is kind of a play on words for center. So the business center. And you talked about technology and, and software. So you know we're big in that same arena, right? How do we leverage the customizations and the workflows and things like that? to help reduce in, in some of the, the maybe not necessarily the need for staffing, but the strain on staffing, right? Uh, so I guess I guess that's my question um, is, is about your name. How did you come up with the name My Goat? And, and tell us a little bit about, about the name and how you use that in your marketing and things like that. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, goats graze and so do autonomous robotic mowers, right? So we, uh, we initially had a business plan or business model that I put together that was centered around the $85 billion, give or take, uh, residential market. And we thought, well, this would be interesting to um, call the robots, the autonomous robots, goats. And um, and it just kind of caught from there. I mean, even though we're a software company, some uh, some of our golf course attend, uh, supervisors don't, don't love the idea of having a goat track as opposed to a golf course. Uh, so there are some snafus as far as marketing is concerned, but so it's not perfect. But um, you know we have uh, inter kind of intertwined the the idea of the goat being a a robot that stays inside of a pen, and a pen is a uh, an area of it's about the size of a football field. It could be several football fields, but it's a goat stays inside that pen, and that pen is 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 basically hardwired with a, an invisible dog fence. And inside that pen, the goat grazes. And uh, we've even had some of our customers, we have uh, little tiny, like three inch blades um, on the bottom of our goats. They call them teeth. So obviously if they're missing teeth, they can't graze. Uh, and it's kind of carried on. Uh, we've got all, everything from the wheels to the operating system, the heart, the head. And, um, and the folks that maintain all of the goats are called shepherds. So of course uh, our shepherds in the commercial space are actually our customers. They're the ones who are responsible for herding the goats. And we have uh, developed a, a fairly extensive certification program where we call them uh, shepherds of level one cer certified or master shepherds if they've completed a certain level where they can manage and maintain, move and monitor multiple goats um, in a, in a you know, maybe 130 or 150 acres across golf courses or any size cemetery because goats um, will only operate and, and work as, as well as the environment permits them to, to. So if if a goat is the size of a pizza box on wheels, which is probably our standard size goat, uh, it will get trapped if there's a limb that falls out of a tree because there's a lightning strike or it just won't work if the lightning strike happens to hit the um, power cord or power brick or imp impact it because they're all electric. So um, so it's, it's been interesting to watch as a software de technology company and, and, and assimilate, I guess, or assign the MyGoat brand with, you know, what do you guys actually do? What does that mean? Um, well, that's interesting. So, so, and you talk about that, so I guess maybe maybe discuss that a little more. We talked through kind of how this is um, the the you're, you're discussing labor, right? So we're talking about a little bit of the labor and the technology and and how those synergies are there. So you're saying you have the goat shepherds, right? Those are the people your your, your customers really that are are kind of monitoring the goats, so to speak. But you're 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 a service based company, and so talk a little bit about that. So you're saying I don't come to you and say I want to buy a mower, and then I try to figure it out and because I would never, I wouldn't have the time, right? It would probably just sit in the garage until 
so I can figure it out. So talk a little, little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, so having spent some time in technology, my experience has been that technology just get, gets better, fast, faster, and cheaper, right? The hardware itself, it's really the software that makes the difference. If, you know, in, in my experience with data storage and servers and enterprise level hardware, um, there was a time where we were selling a terabyte of storage for $120,000. And, you know, today you can get a terabyte flash drive or for, you know, pennies on the dollar. I'm looking down here and see a 32 gig uh, flash drive that I probably got for, you know, 15 bucks. So um, if you really look at that's the way TVs are, you know, the ones you buy at Costco from high definition to whatever. So we know that the hardware is going to get better, faster, cheaper, even with their robots. It, the question is, how do you how do you manage them? How do you integrate them? Um, you know, so our position is that as being robot agnostic, that we welcome the new and latest and greatest hardware, but how do you kind of interface that? It's you know, kind of what Apple does with every one of their iPhones. They, you, know, you get a new different kind of power cord that doesn't seem to work with the previous one all the time, um, which I don't, um, that's that's a different business model than mine. But we, we want you to use any, if you want to use a Droid, great. If you want to use an iPhone, that's fine too. So um, what we're focused on is disrupting an industry we call the status quo. And the status quo is big guy like myself on a big machine that's loud, um, that's limited because it's 1800 pounds. Can't really, you could run it at night or maybe, but most likely you're not. And you're not going to run it in the rain because it'll create a lot of divots if you have a golf course or a cemetery. Um, so what can we do differently? So if we can take autonomous robotic machines that weigh 27 pounds and have them work 168 hours a week, the efficiency is incredibly better and our software is the one that uh, allows um, the operator the shepherd to to realize whether or not the goat is grazing or charging or happens to have an error or, or is uh, is trapped in some way shape or form and with our software we have tools that allow the shepherd to understand if they're if that you know goat is being efficient so let me give you a, a real life example typically a goat that um, that size will be able to maintain about anywhere from two to three football fields a week. So um, you think about the fastest, biggest, most powerful 70 inch or even larger zero turn mower and had somebody unload that from a trailer, um, they would not be able to do two football fields in 35 minutes, but we can um, do that with our technology, right? With the hardware, because it's always going. So it's, it's not the concept of mowing every six days. It's maintaining every day uh, because really the blades of blades of grass they just keep growing and we're able to take advantage of the night and the rain and other things that just can't happen so um, with that level of efficiency we're able to drive um, labor costs down by 30 35 percent and labor productivity up by almost the same number and that is a uh, that's a that's a, a a game changer we're also able to eliminate some of the maintenance um, it's responsible if you hit a you hit a tree stump with a 42 inch blade usually requires a pretty heavy overhaul on the maintenance side uh, but one of the most impactful components of using elect electric robotic mowers is that they make no noise and they have zero carbon footprint and that plays especially well in the cemetery space where you want the level of serenity and and um, an impact um, even from a labor perspective you don't have to have your guy on the mower turn off his mower three times a day when there's a service taking place and you're paying that person $23 an hour or $17 an hour, whatever it might be. And they're sitting there for 45 minutes in, uh, in July, June, and um, it's costing money. And, and so we, we have, we eliminate a lot of those operational um, challenges that sometimes haven't been thought of. I think the last thing is on the environmental side, they don't kick up the grass, um, onto markers, they're not doing any damage to vases or uprights. Again, it's a very small machine that's got a lot of great sensors and ability to uh, to take care of uh, things without damaging the property. And families appreciate that. Yeah, I think that 
question. Sorry, Stephen. We had a no. question come through the chat. Um, somebody had asked, is maintenance easy enough that it can be done by the shepherds? It is. We, it is. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things we emphasize, and it's an important part of our uh, delivery system. So the subscription, just like anything else, um, the, the hardware and the replacement for blades and, and other things are included in the monthly subscription. So it keeps your operating costs flat and your uh, your capital investment uh, limited and minimal. But an emphasis in our uh, in our business is that the adoption component, one of our core values is being an educator. So we spend a lot of time developing certification programs that allow groundskeepers to become technology groundskeepers. So um, it's not necessarily a... Um, a dead end job, so to speak, if you uh, you have an opportunity to continue to have continuing education units and get to understand and and develop a skill set that is unique in the groundskeeping space. And uh, again, the second job of a groundskeeper, especially in the cemetery spaces, is, is not to is, is to mow lawns. You know, the first is really to maintain the property, uh, design, develop, build mausoleums, cremation gardens, dig holes, prepare for ceremonies, and you know they have other responsibilities. It just happens to be that in Tennessee, you're mowing 34 weeks a year. In Michigan, where Arlena is, it's more like 17 to 22 weeks a year. You know, in South Florida, it's, I know they're only 52 weeks in a year, but it's more like 55 to 57 weeks a year because you're mowing twice a week just to maintain it, right? So um, those are, it's become a responsibility where people have to hire more people for it. So the short answer is yes, the, um, the level one, certification, um, you become very proficient at being able to repair the wires and um, move the, the, the goats from one pen to the other. And then we have a level two and a level three and other technologies that go along with that. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, I know you, you touched on this and I, um, as I said, I've talked through the team in the past, but, you know, personally, I, I switched when I moved into this home um, to a, a battery operated electric mower. And my neighbors actually make fun of me because my mower is so quiet. I mean, you can barely even tell it's on. So yeah, we, you were talking to that a little bit, the serenity of it, um, being able to mow, uh, especially at a cemetery, even a business where you, you want things calm and quiet. You know, you don't want dust being kicked up as customers are coming and going. Um, I think that's that's really amazing. Um, and, and probably one of the best parts about it, until you hear an, uh, an electric mower operate, you, you can't even imagine just how, I mean, it's quieter than, you know, a vacuum or or any of those things. So it's, um, it's quite amazing what, what you can do. So, all right. So we talked a little bit about that. And I think, um, you know, I think you, you've, you've touched on a little, but um, do you have any, any stories, uh, success stories that you can share with us of where you've seen this really um, help efficiencies or, or things like that, that you can kind of share, um, you know, just, just something to give us an idea of, uh, you said, you know, 30, 35% in reduction cost in labor. So can you tell us a little bit about, more about that? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, an average size, you know, maybe a, nah, I'd say average, let's just call it, a, you know, 50 acre cemetery, 60 acre cemetery, because you're going in and out of markers and uprights, you know, using a zero turn or, or a riding mower or even a push behind, you know, where we really started having an impact in the cemetery industry where the, we call the private estates or the, the, the super high end areas where, you have gates that families have purchased 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 uh, properties and, you know, opening those gates and having the, the groundskeepers come in there and, and individually mow is just, it's, it's a labor, um, it's labor intensive. So um, we were able to uh, be challenged, I guess, uh, to, uh, to, the, to those areas. Uh, but typically and we've got one example I'm thinking of right now where it's probably close to a 70 acre property. And um, in years past, they've had, two full-time uh, guys on mowers, uh, starting on one end of the property and going to the other, you know, six days, five days a week, six to seven hours a day each, they get to the end. And then on Monday, they start back over and they do that, you know, 30, 32, 34 times a year uh, with a MyGoat solution. You know, you have one person managing and moving and maintaining across that type of a property um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 24, 25, maybe 26 goats. And spending about 35 minutes a week doing that. So you go from two FTEs to a little over a half a full-time employee. So you can redeploy one of those FTEs, obviously, to do some of the things. And the other full-time employee can 
be involved in beautification, right? Pruning the trees or putting uh, mulch down or, or planting flowers. So it's a great opportunity to redeploy um, individuals to be more productive. In addition to that, I mean, the payback period, the investment in MyGoat as a software technology solution is typically anywhere from eight months to 28 months, depending on the size of the property. Usually the larger the property, the faster the payback period, because the calculators that we use with insurance that you have, gas that keeps going up, uh, you know, the, an average zero turn mower is, is burning a gallon of gas for every acre or so. Um, and then every hour of gas that they're burning is equivalent to, you know, the same amount of carbon footprint that you'd get from a, like a Toyota Camry running 300 miles, right? So there's, there's, it begins to really add up quickly when you start to put in all the, have all those factors. On top of that, because the goats are light, they're not doing any damage to the property, uh, which is a huge reduction. And when they go up and over markers, for example, they're also trimming what we call the kind of the carrot tops, where you have uh, guys who have weed whackers and and um, and wire uh, trimmers and, and so forth. It, it, it actually beautifies the campus. So it, you don't have these you know kind of carrot tops that are sticking up, but it's kind of a flat. So it's reducing. We have a few testimonials up to 50% of the traditional labor required to just use, uh, you know, uh, weed whackers. So it's, um, there, there's lots of different areas uh, that, that it has, he has a huge impact, but really the labor, the cost, the maintenance, the cost savings, the flat, you know, operating um, cost. And then of course the environmental impact, which uh, sometimes just gets underestimated, but there are, you know, credits in certain states from, from certain uh, municipalities that, that you can get. And, um, and some of the power companies are super interested in that as well because you know, they like to sell more power. So they're more interested in uh, removing gas and power, uh, gas and uh, oil machines. That's an interesting point for sure. Um, going green, you're right. There's opportunity there for, for funding and things like that. So uh, that's something to think about, I guess, if you're a business owner and, and you're trying to, to manage that grass out there uh, so you talked a little bit, and I feel like we've touched a lot on the hardware. We touched on the maintenance and stuff, um, but I want to talk some about the software and, sure. and how that works. So I guess maybe just give us some insight into that, because I think that's what really sets you apart. You know, I mean, I think the mowers are fun. I think the goat humor is great. Um, I would recommend somebody setting up a call just to hear more of the goat humor. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. I think it's funny. I, I love puns. But tell us a little more about the software and how, how the, you know, you talked about running at night and stuff, but how easy is that to set up and how how is the scheduling work? And, and just a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the best um, best thing I can do is, is it's usually about a 12 to 14 minute demonstration. So I would welcome anyone to participate. Usually our chief technology officer is running and, and um, scheduling those. And we generally have uh, two or three of those available every week. We'll have a number of them available this weekend, obviously, when we head down to Hilton Head and have some folks uh, participate. But the software is broken down into what I, I call um, kind of uh, kind of four categories. So we have developed the dashboard, which is user-friendly. One of our um, core values, again, is, you know, let's make it easy, convenient, and affordable. So we took the approach to not make it overly sophisticated, but rather something that um, that's like a, a Google search bar, right? So you log in and you have initially a, an entire picture of your property. You know where all your pens are. Um, you know where all the wire, wires are on the ground, the guide wires, the boundary wires, et cetera. These are things that we've mapped out and then are available for you. So big picture. Um, and then we, we fall into these four categories of monitor, maintain, move, and manage. So the move part is pretty straightforward, right? There's a scheduling software that says on Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, the goat gets moved to pen number one, and it's goat, it's, it's Billy the goat. So Billy the goat goes from pen one on Tuesday and stays there maybe until, uh, let's say, Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon, uh, Billy the goat starts to work in pen two and goes, you know, Friday afternoon all the way through the weekend, back until Tuesday morning, it goes back to pen number one. And it continues that rotation over the course of days. So again, they're working throughout the day. There may be some um, opportunities where environmentally it, it, it gets trapped because 
it runs up onto a vase or perhaps it runs up onto a twig or there's a, an erosion situation that might be near a sidewalk. Those need to be repaired. So typically, you know, we emphasize with our, our customers that those, those are not gonna fix themselves. And if, if they don't get fixed, um, so what we offer is the maintenance part, which is, you know, when that happens, you have the ability to snap a picture, take a video, um, and log that event as something that's unresolved. And when you do that, then we get to diagnose it from our end, but you also get an opportunity to um, pass that on to your, you know, maybe you have another groundskeeper who's out there with a, a bag of dirt and uh, they need to fill in that hole and it needs to be, or maybe there's a marker that needs to be raised or lowered or changed if it's, you know, we can apply that to golf courses and sports fields and everything else. But since we're having a conversation about cemeteries today, I'll try to keep that in that lane, right? That maintenance also entails our ability to um, provide SMS alerts to all of our customers when the blades need to be changed, right? So it's a proactive approach. We ping the goats every 15 minutes. So we know when they're trapped. So, you know, we can schedule, um, we even have some of our goats with flags on top of them that, you know, come out, you know, three, four, five feet. So you can see them across the horizon. And one customer, I think that's using binoculars across their, uh, across their cemetery to, 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 to spy the flags. But generally when the flag stop, and that means the goat's been, needs to be rescued. And um, so that's the maintenance side of things. It's a very proactive approach. There of course is the, um, which I mentioned was the move. So the schedule, uh, then you have the monitoring part. And the monitoring part is the big, um, kind of the, the big picture. This is where the business leaders and a, and a lot of the supervisors, they enjoy looking at the dashboard. That's like a, it's like gauges on a on an airplane, you know, dashboard, and we measure in what we call goat utilization, which is um, is the goat being utilized to its maximum potential, right? If it's capable of mowing or grazing for 18 hours a day, and then it's charging for six hours a day, how close are you getting to its utilization, and 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 are you optimizing it? You know, um, but that's what we call um, another. Every technology company has a lot of uh, acronyms. We call the HER, which is the human engagement rate. So without the human being involved in rescuing a goat that's trapped, um, you're not going to have a high GER if you have a low HER, right? But ultimately, um, it's the health of the property, right? So this monitoring tool will show you the the financial impact rate, or um, and that is the payback period how much, how many, how many tons of carbon footprint you're saving or eliminating. Um, those big picture items are the monitor uh, side of things. And then the manage. The manage goes back again, full circle to the property and the map itself. It's easy to manage one or two goats, but if you have 30, it gets a little bit more sophisticated and complicated. And that's where, again, our software is designed to have an easy user experience in that management component um, and having multiple people be able to manage it with and, and having issues that are resolved and and making sure that you're optimizing the goat uh, because if you can really optimize the goat and the usefulness of the tool we have many of our groundskeepers who are using it as an advantage to figure out where the imperfections are on their property right they're not going to walk around 30 acres and try to figure out hey, there's a tripping hazard over here in the garden area because these um, particular uprights or these other markers have been sunken or have risen up over the years because of erosion, they could actually be a, a, a liability to the property for loved ones who come and visit their loved ones. But the goat finds it, right? So these imperfections are now um, identifiable through a tool that is going out there and working all the time. And doing its thing, so uh, that is you, you actually have an extension. You almost have what a, one of our uh, members of our team calls a autonomous zero turn mower uh, that goes out and finds imperfections on the property um, while you're going and doing other things. Wow, awesome. my leg looked like you're jumping. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. There, there was another question. Um, kind of goes back to before you talked about before ends, but. Um, what comes with your subscription service? Yeah, um, so it's a it's generally a, a 36 month to um, 48 month contract. And with our subscription, 
We include all, all the hardware, all the blade replacements, obviously continued education units, the certification that goes along with it. Um, the monthly subscription varies um, per pen. It's not per goat, so it's how many pens you have. And usually it's a two to one ratio of goats, uh, you know, two pens for every goat. Uh, we're actually getting more sophisticated with some of the things that we've designed on the hardware side where we're pulling more hardware off of the property. So there's less to damage, um, less opportunity for theft. Uh, it becomes more autonomous. Um, I don't want to speak too early, but we have some interesting uh, switch technology um, that's been de designed and developed where it will allow the goat to be notified when it needs to switch from one pen to the other without actually having a shepherd involved in the movement. Um, we obviously have uh, solar capability. Uh, electricity is the biggest, is, is really the biggest restriction. You know, most big parks or big wide open areas, aside from regional airports, don't have a 110 outlet. Right. So how do we get a 110 outlet there? Do we pull it off of a mausoleum? Do you pull it off of a, a maintenance shed? Do you pull it off the, the funeral home? Is it already out there? Because we can pull some of that electricity off of a fountain or even an electric gate, right? So it's minimal, not a lot of kilowatts. But um, yeah, so the subscription includes, uh, again, the certification, all the maintenance. So any maintenance that you had typically, whether it's oil changes on a, a big machine or blade replacements or blade sharpening, all of that's included in, in the subscription price. Um, it's ongoing. It's paid on a monthly basis in a multi-year contract. Wow. Awesome. Well, and I, I really loved your last point. Um, and I think that that's the kicker is, is you talk about the software and, and you being a software company. And I think that that's cool because what you're saying is, look, you're not just buying a mower. You're getting data and analytics. You're getting information fed to you. You're getting automated notifications, and and those are some of the things that you know as, as a software company. I, I guess maybe maybe uh, I, I guess you know that's a personal thing. We we appreciate that because we offer some of those same things, and and we see how important that can be um, in, in saving and in labor intensity, but not just that, but in 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 servicing, right? I mean, from a servicing standpoint. Um, you, you're talking about being able to to find these things, address these things quicker and faster. Um, you know, beautification, all of those things that people want to see, especially in the, the cemetery space. But in any business, um, you know, golf courses are known for being beautiful, right? So being able to to find those where maybe somebody <laughs> went off road in a golf cart or something, right? Um, but I mean, yeah, I could see where a lot more service. You know, those big um, zero turn things. You know, you you knock over a a headstone or, or something like that and, and maybe they don't report it right away or whatever so um, that, that's interesting you know um, hearing that you can get a lot more um, from that uh, from your service from your software than just just a mower so that's interesting how you're using that technology yeah and i would add this Stephen. i would say that you know again we we look at a lot of technology a lot of hardware development companies are probably eight to ten right now that are making um mowers and, and every day you know it's a it's a again, uh, cheaper, f faster, better, you know, philosophy on the hardware side of things. And, and that's okay, but if you make the wrong decision today or you choose something today that expires tomorrow or next year, it, you know, you may spend thousands of dollars on the wrong piece of hardware and it's useless. You know, it, some folks are evaluating as a true software company. We've, we've had some of our customers suggest that they'd like to just buy massive quantities of hardware, have us retool it. We re-engineer these. We, uh, we have modified these, especially in the cemetery space, that they're unique to us because we know they work a certain way. Um, and then they depreciate and amortize the hardware. But, you know, the, the, the price of hardware goes down dramatically. And, and that works fine for in their accounting department. And it's, it's fine because we can apply the subscription to use the software along along those lines. But, you know, it's a it's a big leap of faith to say this is the right hardware product that we have. This is the right robot for my and also with the subscription. You know, for a golf course, we may use a different type of robot on the tee box that's different from the fairway. That's definitely different from the greens, right? They it cut it cut a little differently. They weigh a different. They, they operate a little different, but they're all run by the software. I mean, the, the the operating system itself is the important part. On the environmental side, again, you know, big machines um, they push down the grass, right? Eighteen hundred pounds. You're going to need to aerate and overseed. You don't need to do that when you have twenty seven pound, you know, robots. I've had a number of people approach me who are in the weed control, pest control business and said, well, what if like, 
could add some liquid on top of these um, robots, these these goats that you have, and we could spread it that way instead of having a weed control guy out there running around. Uh, what if we could? What if we could oversee with this autonomously? You know, the average golf course receives about 87 gallons of gas spilled on the course every year, you know, gas and oil. So it's it's one of those things where you're trying to make it beautiful, but on the other side, you're really not. You know, so. Uh, but again, it's the software, it's the data analytics, it's the collection of the tools, it's the optimization, it's the, it's the customer interface and usefulness of it. And look at all the laptops and hard, hard, uh, you know, hardware that we buy today. And I'm talking to you through a video camera that's, you know, probably nobody had even thought of or you know, needed, you know, eight or 10 years ago, but we're recording this. So, you know, it, it, it now can be extended to, to others without having to write it down and, you know, put in, put it in a document or something of that sort. Right. So it's just, just being more efficient. Absolutely. And that, that is a name of the game. I think, I think anywhere you look and, and optimization is, is a key word. I think every company uses out there, right? I mean, we're always trying to figure out how to optimize um, whether it's labor, whether it's software, whether it's uh, technology and, and, and how can it optimize your business and, and make you stronger, make you better, make you more efficient, get you, get you where you want to grow to um because because growth is is important um so you know and that's one of the things that we like to try to do to work with our partners obviously that's that seems to be your mission as well is to help with that growth to help with um that optimization and and get people where they want to be obviously so um no i think it's really great i think i think it's it's just fascinating and i i just every time i talk to you guys i, I just picture like in the future, you know, you're just going to be walking around and, and everywhere you go, you're going to see these little businesses more and more adopting this because, yeah, I see all these lawnmower services out there and, you know, you drive by and they're kicking grass up everywhere and, and things like that in the middle of the day. Right. And uh, it's just it's, it's just fascinating to think like there's there's ways to do this cleaner, neater, uh, quieter um, and all of that. So I, it's wonderful. Um, I know, Marlena, were there any more questions or anything that came up while we were I'm going. Are we good? Um, no more questions at this time. But if anybody has some some last minute uh, questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We will read them off. Yeah, I, I know we're we're getting kind of kind of close to the end of the time, so I wanted to make sure that we we let everybody know if, if they have any questions, no matter what it is. We'd love to try to try to field those for you um, before before Neil has to move on for the. Oh, oh looks like we got another one. In. All right. So what happens with the grass after it is cut? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. So I think depending on who's asking here, I mean, I, again, I'm not an expert landscaper, but I will say I know enough to be dangerous. And I will say that, you know, the, the, the sucking sound and all the noise that you hear when it pulls that grass up, it's like getting your hair cut, right? Your, your barber pulls the hair up and then cuts it across, right? That's what the traditional mower does in our, um, you know, in, in the mowers we use and the, the grass gets cut, it, it basically uh, kind of cuts the top, maybe a quarter inch or a half inch off the top, and then it mulches. It just drops down. So you don't have to worry about it spraying everywhere. It's actually healthier for the grass, um, whether it's, you know, whether you like it at two and a half inches or up to four and a quarter inches, depending on what your, if it's fescue or um, we, we use it across all, all types of grass in the United States. So uh, it's actually healthier overall in terms of how it does. Um, and if you think about cutting once a week versus maintaining every day or worst case scenario, that pen might not have a, a goat in there grazing for 72 hours. So, you know, I, I get some pushback from landscapers about how great the striping is. It doesn't stripe. I mean, these are some haphazard random patterns. Uh, the sensors are set at a certain point where similar to a Roomba, it goes and finds the grass that needs to be cut down to two and a quarter inches or two and a half inches or two and three quarters of inches. Anything above that, it's, it's going to find it and stay in that pen for that period of time. But it mulches the grass, drops the gra grass clippings down, does not spray the grass clippings everywhere over, you know, head, uh, over markers or, or certainly you don't have to worry about extra um, gas power blower to, to make sure that your uprights are, are clean. So uh, quiet, clean, efficient, um, almost have to see it to believe it. And again, there are all kinds of, that are being developed right now that uh, have similar designs and some that are even more unique. Great. 
That's great. Um, and we have one other one that came up too. Um, do you have any special offers for small non-for-profit cemeteries with a limited budget? Yeah, we, we have, um, since, since we've moved out of the residential space and into the commercial space, you know, generally speaking, we would start with your budget first, uh, you know, even in the nonprofit space and figure out, you know, what are you spending? How much, how much what's your capital purchase this year on a zero turn or um, ride, you know, riding mower? Uh, what are you spending on labor? Uh, the, the, all those kinds of questions we would put into a kind of our ROI calculator. But generally, we start with about five acres, uh, which would be about four goat pens and typically two goats. And that's really kind of our smallest. We call it a kind of a goat preview. Um, generally speaking, uh, that'll give you an opportunity within uh, 28 days to figure out. You're probably knowing about, especially during growing season, whether you know it works for your property within seven to 10 days. And then we have um, typically people go into what we call a paw, which is our uh, pen adoption workflow, which is a 90-day commitment, and that's about 15 acres. That's kind of on the small side for what we would do in the commercial space, whether it's nonprofit or not. Um, you know, the, the pricing is is per pen, and it's on a monthly basis. And in the 90-day situation, you know, we'd have an upfront cost, which is the installation. We put the wire in the ground, but 90% of the time. You know, we need to make sure that somebody is on that property who it, who can become a shepherd. So in addition to electricity, we need to have somebody who can, uh, again, monitor, manage, move, and maintain to go through our software. So they have to be present. Um, so it just really depends. I, I can't give an exact answer. And as far as a special rate, I think we would very seriously look at uh, what you're spending today and, and see if it works for your budget. Makes a lot of sense, and that's that's you know I think it's always good too to show that that return on investment and how how you can help people. So that that's awesome that you can do that, and um, you know labor cost you know is another thing that you were talking about um, where technology is getting cheaper. You know labor costs are going up, and it's it's getting harder. Gas is going up. All those other intangibles that um, you know you can't. To whereas your static model does help a little bit with um, budgeting and planning and, and those things. So I think that's that's really cool that that you guys are offering that. Um, uh, so you're, you're saying that kind of a five acre lot uh, is, is kind of the minimum area that you would recommend that this service really works well for. Yeah, on the super low end, I would say most folks come in, especially in the cemetery space, uh, they're coming in at anywhere minimum of 15 acres. And, you know, some cemeteries are out there with four or 500 acres and they're, you know, um, they have probably about 25% maybe up to 30% of the property that's currently electrified. So when we take that position, we say, well, the low hanging fruit are these areas that you already have electrified. The next option or the next phase would be electrification of that property or utilizing some of our solar uh, goat sheds that, uh, that are available to, uh, to run the goats instead of running. And, uh, and we could talk, I, I could spend a whole time, you know, another half an hour talking about that. Uh, on the solar yeah. opportunities but uh, yeah on the commercial side it really applies and like i said the bigger the property usually the faster the payback period because uh, once we kind of dig in with our cfo and our roi tools you know I, I look at technology just like i think most technologists look at it and that is you know it's either an roi you're, you're getting a return on investment which means you're you know you're paying money to make money or um you you have a tco which is your total cost of ownership and that is your um, you're saving money when you spend money, right? So either saving money or making money. Um, when, and there's a combination somewhere in there of, of the TCO ROI model and the calculators that we use. Yeah. Well, that's, that's incredible. Um, you know, I know we're, we're getting up against the time. I, I am, again, I'm so excited to meet you guys in person, to see your booth at SCCFA to learn more. Um, you know about i want to hear more about the solar pins i think that's kind of cool uh, how that technology is working um so yeah i'm excited um if we don't have any more questions i think we can go ahead and and move forward with uh with everything let this call in great well thanks so much i appreciate the opportunity look forward to putting a name and a face together here uh, outside of uh, virtual uh, soon enough so marlena and steven thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so Take much. Care. Thanks. Bye, guys.